Thank you very much for the nice introduction. Uh, I, I'm very happy to be here. I got here in mid-August, and I'm on my sabbatical, which is a semester sabbatical, and it's been a very wonderful experience. Um, a part of my uh, visit uh, consisted in uh, uh, working, uh, continuing this work on uh, treatments for retinitis pigmentosa with uh, Suzanne Lenhart. And uh, what I'm hoping to show you today is some of the work that we've done um, and also uh, some of the um, recent results that we've obtained um, since I arrived. So let me begin by giving you an outline of this presentation. Uh, so I'll, I'll begin by providing you with an introduction, just some background on, uh, a little bit of background on eyes and the disease and the treatments. Uh, then I will move on to the mathematical formulation of a model that describes interactions of photoreceptors, and then um, also uh, show you our optimal control problem. Um, from there, I'll discuss a little bit more about treatments and make the connection between how the treatments um, are incorporated into our optimal control problem. And at the end, I will show you some of the results that we have obtained. Um, so in uh, 2015, the World Health Organization estimated that about 253 million people suffered from um, some form of uh, vision impairment. Uh, 36 million uh, were blind, and the rest had uh, suffered from moderate to severe vision impairment. Um, blindness can be prevented in 80% um, of vision impairments if the available information and um, the intervention is applied timely, or in the case of vision loss, if the treatment is um, successful. What you see here is a depiction of the human eye. So this is uh, a profile of the human eye. This is the outer portion that we all see um, in each other, and this over here would constitute the interior of the eye. As light comes in through the eye, um, in this direction, it's converted to vision by photoreceptors that are located in the back of the eye in the retina, which is located in that region. Uh, this uh, drawing here, or depiction, is a uh, zooming in of uh, a portion of the retina. And you'll see many components. But in particular, what I'd like to highlight are the photoreceptors, which are uh, uh, located over here. Um, those that have a rectangular shape are what we call the rods, and those that have a triangular shape are uh, what are called the, the cones. Um, the photoreceptors, they all play different roles in creating visions in humans. So as I pointed out, they're located in the retina of the human eye. There's approximately 120 million rods and um, 6 million cones. Um, their roles in human vision, so they contribute to the process of creating images. The cones, for example, determine the color. The rods help with the night vision. Um, some facts about the photoreceptor regeneration. It takes about approximately 12 days. And there are some growth factors. Um, so there are metabolites, ions, and water that are needed to reduce the deplet depletion and ensure the functionality. Um, Uh, diseases that are attributed to photoreceptor regeneration uh, are not known to have a cure. Um, some examples of these diseases are, you know, um, untreated detachment of the retina, um, and uh, retinitis pigmentosa is another example of that, which is the focus of this presentation. Um, so what occurs is, um, over the lifetime of the rod, some of them may undergo a mutation and um, as they mutate, then they begin to die off, and that's when we begin to see, uh, dif have difficulty in um, sight. Over time, as the rods begin to die off, then the cones will also die off because the cones, their survival depends on the rods. Um, because of the role of uh, the photoreceptors in dying, uh, Retinitis pigmentosa is referred to as a neurodegenerative disease. Um, it's responsible for causing blindness. 
It affects 1.5 million people worldwide. Not much is known about the, the, the disease, and like I pointed out, this mutation occurs primarily in the rods. And there are no long-term uh, therapies available. Um, so what we want to do um, in this is we want to study the effects of treatments on photoreceptor survival. Uh, there's a couple of treatments that have uh, been published and that we are focusing on. Uh, the first one is from 2004, and it refers to a protein that's given, administered to the cones directly, and it helps to lengthen their survival. Um, this is, the acronym is RDCVF, and it stands for rod-derived cone viability factor. Uh, the scientists in France who discovered this protein coined it, uh, this term, this uh, RDCVF. Um, and so what we're going to do is we're going to take some of uh, these experiments and we're going to formulate this optimal control problem and see if we can reproduce this survival rate of photoreceptors and um, to what was obtained uh, in, the, in, the, in the laboratory. The second one is, uh, let's see, I always mispronounce this, but I'll just call it MAMF. <laughs> and uh, this is a little more recent. Uh, the focus on this one is to uh, reduce the rate of apoptosis that's observed uh, in the photoreceptors. And finally, uh, what we're going to do as well, and the bulk of my, uh, the work that I've done related to this while I've been here at Nimbus has been what if I combine, what if these two treatments are combined? And uh, we view all of them as optimal control problems. Um, in terms of uh, actual experiments that have happened for mixed treatments, uh, there's nothing that has been documented, at least to my knowledge. I um, have reached out to some of these uh, scientists, and it's just something that they're all very interested in doing, but they haven't actually done it yet. Um, so let's define. Yeah. No, it's, it's uh, okay, so it, exactly, the, all the photoreceptors. So it includes the, the, the rods and the cones, whereas the RDCVF is only for the cones. Okay? All right, so, um, so let's de begin by defining some mathematical terminology. Um, we're going to define T as our time variable, and the units for this will be in days. The R sub N will be the normal rods, the R sub M, the mutated rods and um, the cones will be labeled with the state, as a state variable C. And the trophic pool, which consists of all these nutrients, we'll just, we're just gonna lump them all together into um, this state variable called T. Okay. Uh, some assumptions that we make for the model. Um, experiments suggest that only one eye is considered. Um, we ignore spatial variables. Uh, the cost of the mutation is also not considered. We assume that retinitis pigmentosa has begun. The rods and the cones obtain uh, the nutrients from one trophic pool. And the trophic pool remains bounded in the absence of photoreceptors. And some more assumptions. Uh, so no rods or cones are born in a mature retina. So uh, their existence is dependent on the trophic pool. And in the case of the cones, it's also dependent on the, exist the, the presence of rods. And uh, we assume that shedding is a death process. Um, in 2012, uh, Camacho and Workus um, published a work where they proposed a mathematical model describing the interactions in these photoreceptors. So if I look at this image over here uh, with the superimposed um, compartmental model, uh, this uh, region over here will uh, constitute what's called the trophic pool. That's where all the nutrients come from. Um, these are the rods. The darker ones are the mutated rods, and of course these are the cones. And as you can see, the arrows describe the interaction. So for instance, the trophic factor contributes in a positive way to all the photoreceptors. Uh, the cones, their uh, survival depends not just on the trophic pool, but also on the rods and so forth. This leads to the following uh, system of ordinary differential equations. So again, just when we go over this, right, we see that um, if the, rod, the, the normal rods and the trophic pool interact, then they contribute in a positive way to the population for the normal rods. This is a death uh, 
rate. Uh, this is a mutation rate, so a normal rod um, will be removed from this uh, population when it mutates, and then it's added to that other population, the mutated rods. And similarly, you can see for the cones over here, right, uh, the rods contribute to their survival in a positive way, as does the trophic pool, and that's the, this over here is the death rate. And for the trophic factor, uh, we assumed that it was bounded, so we, for this problem, uh, it was modeled uh, as having a, uh, um, a carrying capacity um, of gamma over K. And of course, uh, this trophic pool is reduced as the photoreceptors consume from that uh, nutrient pool. So, sure, I mean, yeah, it's bilinear, that's right. Mm -hmm. Okay, all right, so then for the uh, RDCBF, these are proteins secreted by the rods, they're essential for cone survival. The experiments from 2004 uh, demonstrated that there's a 40% rescue effect, and um, it significantly preserves the cone function, even when 95% of the cones are dead and blindness may be prevented. Um, it's produced by both normal and mutated rods. And one of the key um, outcomes from this experiment is that rods were not necessary for cone survival. So if injected directly to the cones in the absence of rods, uh, the cones were still, uh, would still survive. For the MAMF treatment, um, so then it reduces, let's see, the rate of apoptosis in neurons. Uh, apoptosis, if you've never heard the term before, this is cell suicide due to stress or injury done for the well-being, for the greater good of the community, in this case, the greater good of all the, organ the organism. Um, stress and injury uh, lead to higher rates of apoptosis. And um, MAMF is a treatment of ret uh, tre the MAMF treatment of retinitis pigmentosa is pat patented, but not much is known. And what we're doing in all of these experiments is what we refer to as uh, carrying out in silico um, experiments, which essentially means that we're using mathematics and computers to model some, uh, some of this phenomena. So in both instances, if I look at the compartmental models superimposed on the rods and the cones, then um, in the RDCBF treatment, just to single out one component that, it's, uh, that RDCBF is addressing is the fact that um, as the rods begin to die off, then there will no longer be a contribution of the rods to the cone population. In the MAMP treatment, um, we're trying to address the death or reduce the death of these photoreceptors. So in the, let's see, if I single out the cones, for example, it's these, this outgoing arrow that we're trying to reduce that rate. So um, our goal from a mathematical perspective is to uh, formulate an optimal control problem where we're both at the same time maximizing the survival of a photoreceptor or all the photoreceptors while at the same time minimizing uh, uh, the treatment that's being administered. Um, if you look at the box on the left, um, that's work that uh, we did in uh, 2014 and it was published. And this focused strictly on uh, the RDCVF treatment. And um, we were able to also obtain a 40% rescue effect on the cones. Uh, we carried out several experiments for this, but I'm only going to show a couple of our results um, for this presentation. For the box on the top right, uh, we have this uh, treatment of MAMF, where uh, now we're trying to reduce the rate of apoptosis. And this is currently under review. And um, finally, for the mixed treatments case, this is just a big picture. So we're going to see if we can combine both of them and solve a two-control optimal to control optimal control problem. Um, uh, we only have numerical results, and in all of these instances, uh, all the experiments uh, that have been carried out, actually for these two rather, uh, they've only been carried out in mice. They haven't been done in humans yet. Um, so just a little background on optimal control, deterministic optimal control, okay? So we have a system of differential equations and the functions uh, the, that constitute the differential equations are what we refer to as the state variables. And the control function is another function that's going to affect some sort of behavior 
in the solution in the long term. So typically, uh, the letter used for this is U, so that's what we call our control function. Um, our uh, state equations, just for this very simple example, before I move on to the, more, the higher dimensional one, let's just consider a scalar ODE. So just generally speaking, we have this scalar ODE, and we construct an objective functional that's going to uh, yield what we're trying to do. So for instance, are we trying to uh, just maximize the cones? Are we trying to maximize all the photoreceptors? And so forth. And how do we want you know, this treatment to be minimized as well? Um, so the system of ODEs models the situation. In our case, it's modeling the interaction between uh, the photoreceptors. Uh, we're going to choose, you know, we choose a format and the bounds on the controls and we design the appropriate objective functional. So examples of uh, problems where optimal control is also employed um, are listed below. In the 1950s, uh, Pontrigen uh, and his collaborators developed an optimal control theory where uh, they introduced the adjoint variables and attached them to the um, ordinary diff to the state equations, um, much like what's done in optimization. It is an optimization problem. Um, much like the more conventional optimization problem where you're minimizing, for example, a quadratic function. But the difference in optimal control is that uh, the solution that we're looking for also depends on a variable. It's not, um, it's not, a, it's not a value, it's another function, so that might move as well. Um, so there's a lot of, well, there's also a lot of similarities between this a new function that's being, functional that's being def the function that's being defined, you know, called the Hamiltonian, uh, to the Lagrangian. There's also um, some mathematical differences in that as well. Uh, so this uh, over here is a formulation of our optimization problem. So we're maximizing this objective functional. This is the piece that we construct and it's subject to the state equations which are describing, you know, in this case, the, um, the photoreceptor interactions. Uh, we have these initial conditions, and then, of course, um, the final solution at the final time is free. It's the Hamiltonian has this following form. So it's going to be the sum of the integrand plus this lambda uh, function, which has been introduced. That's the adjoint variable. That also depends on time, times the right-hand side of the ordinary differential equation. Uh, we maximize uh, the Hamiltonian with respect to u at U star on the interior of the control set. So we obtain, we take the partial of the Hamiltonian with respect to U, we obtain this equation, and um, we solve for U, and that gives, us a that gives us the characterization for the optimal control. Um, this over here is uh, the adjoint equations, which are the result obtained from the antigen maximum principle. And, um, uh, this other condition here is also enforced, which is called the transversality condition, and this requires that the adjoint variable is uh, zero at the, at the final time. So in the case of our um, RDCVF treatment, so we incorporate uh, this treatment only in the cone, so we want it to affect only the cone population, and the objective functional is defined in such a way that we're trying to maximize the cone population, while at the same time we're trying to minimize the treatment, and that explains the minus sign over here. Okay. For the MANF treatment, in this case, we're trying to maximize all the photoreceptors, which is why we have the sum of all of these terms over here, while at the same time we're trying to minimize uh, the MANF treatment, which is represented by the function B. And in our state equations, we incorporate uh, this treatment in the following way. So what we do is, or what we did rather, is um, we took the death rate for the photo, for, let's consider the normal rod. We took the death rate for the uh, normal rod and we broke it up into two death rates. <laughs> uh, one, of them, one of which was the death rate due to apoptosis. So as the treatment is increased and the treatment in our case is bounded between zero and one, then it, when it, it's increased, the maximum value that it can attain is one, and you will see that this whole term here zeroes out. So we are reducing the death rate. And we do the same thing for the other a mutated rod as well as uh, the cone. Um, so 
uh, we obtain an optimality system. So we solve this numerically using uh, what's called the backward forward sweep. What? Did I get that right? Wrong. Forward backward sweep. <laughs> I got that backwards. <laughs> um, so then we do the forward backward sweep, and uh, the state equations plus the initial conditions are solved using some um, ODE solver uh, uh, forward in time, hence the name forward sweep. Uh, in the backward sweep, uh, we take uh, the solution obtained from here, and then we um, solve this backward in, backwards in time. And we do that because the, uh, this is a, an ODE that depends on, on lambda and um, the information that we had um, in terms of initial conditions uh, was the lambda evaluated at the final time, hence we go backwards in time. Once we've obtained solutions for both of these ODEs, uh, we use that information and um, in, uh, we had uh, algebraic expressions for these um, um, optimal controls, which is and evaluate the function at that particular time. Yeah. That the result is positive? Yeah. 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 Um, um, so we, um, we, yeah, we just, we just didn't get that. Yeah, no, we just didn't get that. All right, so um, here are some of the parameter values that we used um, to solve the RDCVF problem. Um, so, uh, yes. Why is there a difference between the normal and the stable? The normal and the mutated rods. So let's see, you mean You mean for the A sub N and A sub M? Yeah. Um, you know, some of, let's see. Some, it, yeah, so um, let's see. I think, so if I'm not mistaken, some of these were obtained either from the literature or they were approximated using a parameter estimation. So I, I. Is there any valid reason for like I saw the mutated maybe? If the mutation rate is tiny, why would they accumulate? And if they accumulate, what possibility is because they grow more? Let me see. Let me go back to the system here. Um, so then these would be. So we're assuming that they're growing at the same rate. That's just an assumption that we made. But uh, I, I, if, if correct, yeah. But given that they accumulate, why would they accumulate? If they're neutral, you would expect that you shouldn't see mutants very often because mm -hmm. they have always variable frequency. Mm -hmm. So if it's only mutation, a very small process, but actually mm -hmm. the prevalence is that if it happens often, it must be a something more substantial, like they have an abundance. Yeah, no, I...
So you're wondering why the a sub n and a sub m are the same. Yeah, I, um. Because to me, it seems like mutants are probably the reason why they could grow, would grow more often, is just because there's some kind of collective advantage to it. Um, I don't know the answer to that, but I, I suspect um, what this is, what's going on here is uh, this, you know, this mutation rate is maybe taking that into account. It's reducing the population of the normal rods, but it's increasing the normal, the mutated rods. You mean, what do you mean by mutating back, like back to RN? Uh, yeah, no, we, we, don't, we don't consider that. <laughs> we only consider the mutation in one direction. And um, I, I don't know if they do mutate in the opposite direction either. Um, um, well, so from, from my understanding, when it, came to, when it comes to the mutation, that's a topic of that, that's not clarified. It's also, there's a lot of debate in that. That was my understanding from that. So then this is what we chose for that. Is, is it known what type of mutation it is? Is there actually? No, no, no. I, no I, not much is known, no. Yeah. Okay, yeah, no. I, yeah. Okay. All right, so then what we did uh, mathematically is um, for numerical purposes, we non dimensionalized our equation. Our numbers, if you notice, they were on the order of millions. In the experiments that were carried out, uh, they were done over the course of 14 days, and uh, the rescue was considered for many different stages of retinitis pigmentosa, so uh, we have five different stages, and as we increase from the first stage to the fifth stage, uh, it deteriorates more and more and more, and uh, I'm only going to present the fourth and the fifth stages where you will see that the rods, um, both mutated and normal rods, no longer exist. Um, and then we also computed a, the rescue effect using a formula that was presented um, in uh, one of the experimental papers. So if this formula is given over here. So it's considering the net change. And um, after simplification, we end up getting this formula. And then we compare uh, what we have numerically to what was obtained um, in the experiments. So for the case of stage four, uh, you, we, we see that we don't have um, any more rods left in the population. So our initial conditions for the cones and both the trophic factor is given over here, and we chose this weight value over here uh, to be of the order four times 10 to the ninth. Uh, the percentage of cones rescued after we ran our numerical um, uh, simulations, uh, we obtained a 40.23% uh, rescue effect. Uh, I'm only gonna show uh, the graphs for the control and the cones, and the, oops, this is missing the legend. So then the blue curve uh, corresponds to the solution with the optimal control, and this black curve corresponds to the solution without any um, optimal control. We also considered stage five, and once again we have um, uh, no rods, and there was also a deterioration in both the cone and the trophic pool. Um, this was the weight value, and we were obtaining once again uh, um, a 40% 40, 40 rescue effect. And these are some of our numerical results again. Once again, the the blue line, the blue curve, excuse me, uh, corresponds to the solution with the control and the black one to the solution without the control. So in the case of the uh, other optimal control problem with the MAMP treatment, um, this was uh, three different experiments that were carried out. And um, this is the one where we're trying to reduce the rate of apoptosis. Uh, two of those experiments were carried out over the course of two days, and one of those experiments was carried out over the course of five days. Um, uh, we consider these initial conditions, and yeah, and, and then you'll also notice that um, unlike the stages four and five from the RDCVF case, uh, this occurs at an earlier stage because we still have rods uh, present um, when we started the runs. Um, here are some of our uh, parameter values, and since we had different um, experiments, then some of these that you see vary, they changed. Um, depending on the run. And uh, some of these values, uh, I'm citing the sources that we obtained them from. Uh, 
uh, th this, and this, like I said, this is not comprehensive. Okay, so um, we consider, so then to uh, compute the survival rate, uh, this time we uh, used this formula and uh, we compared uh, our numerical results to their experimental results. Uh, what they observed is, is there was rescue in both cases with or without treatment and um, they provided a range of values for this. And so then we, using, using the information that I showed you, we also see if we could reproduce the same uh, um, survival rate for the photoreceptors. So in the case of the first model, the difference between the three models, uh, by the way, um, consisted on uh, the intensity of the light uh, that the mice were subjected to, which uh, uh, created stress in the eye and then um, um, produced, you know, led to um, a higher rate of apoptosis. So then for the first model, uh, we look at the total rods and uh, uh, what we did for this case is we ran several numerical experiments. Um, the dashed um, black curve uh, corresponds to the solution if we had uh, provided uh, uh, the maximum, the upper bound for the optimal control over the entire um, time interval. Um, the blue curve is the optimal control solution, and then the red dashed curve is the one where uh, no treatment has been administered. So as you can see, um, if we provide uh, this treatment at the maximum the entire time, the number of rods and cones is the highest. Um, however, when we looked at the uh, objective functional, which is what we were using to measure success, um, when the objective functional was evaluated at the solution obtained using the optimal control, uh, it had a larger maximum than it did for this case and that case as well. Um, and over here below, you'll see the graphs of the control functions, and this is the maximum control, this is um, no control, so this is maximum treatment, no treatment, and then optimal control. Mm -hmm. Can the treatment make things worse? Can the treatment make things worse? Um, so I don't know, but this is why we're trying to minimize the treatment as well. Yes, yes. Um, Um, so we're maximizing this objective functional. Um, these terms are positive, so if we're maximizing them, then they're going to go to a larger value. But here, even though it's a quadratic term, I'm negating it, so uh, yes, that's a treatment. So they're both moving in opposite directions. It can, it can only, so, okay, so then, um, the con it always has a positive effect. If D is positive, it always has a positive effect on the rod. If, so, okay, um, and V also, V will always be bounded between zero and one. So then, so, um, when it is equal to one, then this term zeroes out. Well, this is not, so the, what, okay, so we're trying to minimize the treatment because it might be toxic to the human body. So too much might poison. Um, uh, too much, too much treatment? Well, Well, 
Okay, so if you look at our, right, let me m move to here. Okay, right. Okay. So when we when we defined our objective functional, right? So we were that's mathematically speaking the function that we were trying to maximize. And um, if we assume that we have the maximum dosage of the treatment that's being administered, that's this curve over here. And you'll look at the rod and the cone populations, and they're definitely the highest, right? Okay. But interestingly enough, when you look at the objective functional, um, evaluated at these curves, it doesn't yield the maximum to object the functional. This does. <laughs> is it better? From a, if you look at the objective functional, yes. <laughs> um, well, we're using the objective functional to measure success. And that's, that's been the case, that's, we did that across for optimal control. We always compared it at the maximum, um, at the upper bound for the control, and then uh, we constructed this objective functional that told us how to measure success. And, um, and the examples that we ran, you know, the optimal control solution always yielded a larger value. Um, well, so I don't know much about, you know, incorporating randomness into this, and I don't know how that would change the, math, the, the mathematical problem either. Um, yeah. So here we have another experiment, and once again, um, we see very similar phenomena. Here's the rods, here are the cones, and the blue curves represent uh, the solutions with optimal control. Um, this is no treatment, or the control was set to zero. And this is when the control was set to um, the upper bound. And as before, the objective functional evaluated at the blue curves, um, blue functions, uh, yielded a larger value than all the others. Um, this table summarizes um, all that. So then the columns that have been shaded in gray are uh, range, are intervals uh, obtained from the uh, lab experiments. and. Um, these columns over here, the third column and the fifth column, are um, uh, the rescues that we were obtaining uh, numerically. So for instance, in the case of no experiment for this particular mass experiment, uh, we were um, obtaining this rescue for the photoreceptors that landed inside that interval. Um, when we uh, look at the next pair, um, uh, in the lab experiments, uh, that involved the treatment, they were obtaining a survival rate or rescue uh, for the photoreceptors within this range, and numerically, um, we were getting a value within uh, inside that interval as well. Uh, so uh, when I came here, I I wanted to look at mixed treatments. So then, uh, uh, we uh, developed the um, following optimal control problem. So this is our objective functional. And uh, we are uh, going to be maximizing uh, all the photoreceptors. But this time, we're going to be minim minimizing uh, two uh, different treatments, um, which are represented by the sum of those two square functions. And um, you'll probably notice some similarities in the way that the control was incorporated into the state system of equations. So this over here is the um, uh, are the terms that uh, were inherited from the MAMF model, and this one over here is the term that was inherited from the RDCBF model. Um, so we ran this for the uh, using the same parameter values in the MAMF paper, and we also considered the same experiments. Um, so then, the this time the dashed blue line uh, represents the solution when we have the optimal. Uh, controls, both, con both controls uh, set to the maximum dosage. Um, this solid black line is our solution uh, with um, obtained using, you know, 
with optimal control. Um, the red curve is when no treatment or no control was incorporated. Um, so here are our control functions. We were comparing this uh, also to the case where we um, only have one control and um, as opposed to two controls. So then you'll probably notice some similarities. They're not exactly the same, but they are very similar. So this over here, the red line is the one corresponding to the MANTH treatment, whereas the blue line is the one corresponding to the RDCDF. Um, again, we're using the objective functional to measure um, success. And um, in the case where we only look at one treatment as opposed to uh, two treatments, um, the objective functional value was larger in that case, and there was a gain of 5.7%. If I look at the objective functional evaluated at the optimal control and compare it to the objective functional um, set to the maximum um, controls, then once again, uh, the objective functional is telling us that we have a larger uh, value, and this time we had a gain of 25.2%. Uh, uh, um, the rescue in the case of uh, one control, and here we were measuring the rescue of all photoreceptors, not just the cones. Um, there was a 60.1% uh, rescue. In the case of two controls, 62.4%. Um, uh, for the other experiments, very similar situation. Um, and um, um, same thing, that's the set at the maximum controls, optimal control, no treatment. And this over here are the graphs of the control functions. And once again, we were observing uh, very similar, um, 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 we were obtaining very similar conclusions. Um, with two treatments, there was a gain of 13% as opposed to only one treatment. And of course, at the optimal control, the objective functional was larger than it was at the maximum control. And here are the rescues for the, for the uh, photoreceptors. And then for the last treatment, uh, these are, this is the curve, and once again, we were obtaining very similar results. Okay, so just some future work. Um, investigate mathematically the case of periodic dosage for each treatment separately, and then compare results. Explore periodic dosage uh, for combined treatment, and um, of course, the combined treatment is ongoing work that we've been doing. Um, all the work that's been presented here has uh, been done in collaboration with uh, uh, the following uh, mathematicians, um, Erica Camacho at Arizona State, uh, Suzanne Lenhart, um, who's here with us today, uh, Christina Villalobos at the University of Texas, and then Stephen Workus, also at Arizona State. Um, just want to acknowledge um, this is um, this my time here at UT was a long time in the making, probably more than a year um, long to prepare my visit, and there's been a lot of uh, institutions and people that have uh, been instrimental in me being here, so I want to acknowledge Nimbus um, for their support this whole semester, of course the math department here at UT, and my institution for having provided um, funding for me to also come here, and um, so last but certainly not the least, uh, Suzanne um, for um, her time, her support during my time here. So at this point, I'll stop. Thank you. Comments. I'm going to start with making a comment. So uh, um, I think that it's very important to realize that when you're st studying uh, drug dosage problems, that lots of times giving too large of a dose is damage, but it's not always damage right there in the system that you're modeling. So you know like when we see uh, you know, warnings for drugs that if you, this drug can cause something else, right? So a lot of times you won't see it in that model right there that it's gonna cause a problem with the mouse, but it might cause a problem with somewhere else in the mouse, right? So that's why it's a lot of times high levels of dose is, is toxic, but it's, you don't see it right in that particular thing you're modeling, so anyway. Okay, so um, any other comments? That, yeah. I have, uh, I have two questions. Um, the first question is, uh, those controls, are they uh, just open loop controls, or are they, uh, the controls are open loop control you, or feedback? What, what do you mean by open loop? Open loop, this means that you're not measuring anything, you know, from, you're not measuring your states. 
So, so, you, so the V does not depend on you know, C or R, those state variables, right? It's just, you're not, thinking, you're not measuring anything from, from the system itself. This is what I mean by open loop. Um, okay, so let's see. Um, so then, to say that it entirely doesn't depend on the state variables, right? We use uh, the um, solutions obtained from the state equations and the adjoint equations, which involve state variables and adjoint variables, uh, to characterize our optimal control. So in that sense, it does depend on that. I don't know if that's what you mean. Yeah, yeah, that's what I mean. Actually. I mean, but it it's not it's not feedback and it's not open loop. It's between. It's a combination of the states and the adjoints both go into the. So, so, so what I'm trying to uh, to get to is if you have uh, if you have to use some of the states, then on 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 the I, you know how are you going going to measure them? You know how are you, because you know when you implement this in real time, if you need some information about a number of cones or whatnot, how are you going to measure that? How are you going to get that information? That's one thing. The second thing is uh, about you know if you use like U max like you just max your treatment. It's not capturing in the model because um, you have uh, you, um, you have a combination of variables, right? So you have a trade-off between all those state variables. Like if you, I'm sure if you play on those weighting that you are using the alphas, you know, if you play on them and then you say, okay, I'm going to just maximize, you know, like whatever C, okay, and get you know, and maybe forget about about the other state variables, maybe. If you do that, then maybe you can you can get just you know just I, ma I max out my treatment. So there is a trade-off in your cost function. That is why you know you don't get you know just maximizing the treatment, just you know giving as much as as possible. That would be the the op the optimal the optimal you know um, pro the optimal solution mm -hmm. because you have a s you have a trade-off between those state variables in your in your cost function. And then if you change, I'm sure if you play with the weighting f with the weightings. <laughs> You know, you get a different solution. Oh, absolutely, you absolutely do. Yeah, no, absolutely. Trade-off is a common thing in optimal control. Yeah. The whole point is you yeah. you didn't have to do something optimal. There was no trade-off. You just do the yeah. best thing and not worry about it, right? Yeah. Uh, so a lot of times in treatment, uh, you know, there are vitamin A supplements that are given to patients, have you thought about looking at changes in the trophic pool? So right now it's constant nutrients for the rods mm -hmm. and cones, but have you thought about looking at how varying that nutrient pool might change the solution? Um, no, we haven't, no. Okay. So um, the RDCVF paper, um, uh, the authors who discovered that protein, um, they are aware of this work, and they actually have uh, jointly a publication with one of my with Erica Camacho, so they're fully aware. Um, as far um, so it's I my understanding is that they 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 were positive about they had positive thoughts about that um, for the as far as the MANF treatment. Uh, it's currently under review, so um, I have I have reached out to them, but uh, we're gonna we decided we're gonna wait until the paper has been um, finalized to share that with them. So you you showed um, modeling results and comparing with the data from the three strains of mice, and there was kind of a good match. Does that mean that the people who did the experiment did it optimally? <laughs> I, um, <laughs> I, you know, yeah, well, I don't, I don't know the answer to that, but I don't know if, uh, yeah, I don't know, I don't know, yeah, no, I, I don't know the answer to that. <laughs> but I guess we got realistic yeah. rescue effects, but whether it's optimal from their viewpoint. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, so, so in response to Vitaly's question, the, the control that was applied was a dynamic control. It was not bang, bang, or on, off. So my bet is, and whatever they did in these little mice, the poor things, 
they did not do any kind of continuous control, right? No. They did basically, they did an injection or something like that. So, it, it, it led to something that may or may not have improved the survival rate of the rods and cones. Yes, I mean, it, actually, the treatments that you showed for those three mouse poor little subjects, um, they were always improved, right, in the, in the treatment. Mm -hmm. What you don't see, perhaps, are the experiments that they did that may not have improved. So do you know anything about other treatments that they might have tried out before mm -hmm. they finally got some that actually did improvement? Mm -mm, no, I don't. No. So that it, it may well be that, as Vitali said, they have carefully selected the magnitude of the treatment and maybe the mice strains. I mean, there's lots of strains of these mice that 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 really led to a, a improvement. We don't know. Did you have a comment? You had raised your hand earlier. Actually, I just want to ask you uh, uh, what kind of software you use to uh, model these uh, uh, and the estimate parameters. Uh, like what kind of toolboxes? Um, so, so let's see. For to run the the differential equations, uh, we did MATLAB. I think everything was done in MATLAB. Yeah, using like the F min built-in functions. Yeah, but not all the parameters were obtained using parameter estimation. Some of them were also obtained from the literature directly. So all the sources were also provided there. Yeah. I did want to say something about optimal control of time varying controls. It is true that sometimes you'll get a time varying control that's probably not feasible to implement, and definitely. We've done that many times in other problems where we got this time variant control, and what we do is we use it to build a feasible control, and it will be pretty close, a good approximation. So sometimes this time variant one can just be used to build an extremely good approximation that is feasible to implement. So. Yeah. You're next. I'll get you in a second. You want it? You have to be supposed to be on the mic, sorry. <laughs> so, uh, in your mixed treatment case, uh, the optimal control led to decaying rods and cones as opposed to the maximum, uh, no, not this one, the other two. Yeah, so here, so. We, uh, this is the optimal the, solution. The U max, V max is yeah. leading to increasing number of photoreceptors. So, so this looks like a really, uh, not 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 a good good uh, answer to the disease. So you don't want to apply the optimal control because your photoreceptors are decaying. Mm -hmm. So is this because uh, you uh, in your objective function is it more reasonable to have interaction effects between uh, the cost of the control and uh, the photoreceptors? So I, let me backtrack this. You're questioning this curve, right? Yeah, I'm, qu I'm questioning that uh, the black curve is decaying, the black curve. Is decaying oh. as opposed to the dotted blue. So the dotted blue is better because your, your photoreceptors are not dying out. Um, and you, the mouse won't go blind. Uh -huh. But in the black one, the mouse will go blind because it's a decaying function and eventually you might lead, it might lead to... But then you can give them another treatment. And, and yeah, um, but uh, that is not optimal because you are having a lot of this cost kicking in, and that's well, yeah, it's a trade-off. Right. So uh, my question is: Is it uh, more reasonable to uh, use a objective function where you have uh, interaction between the costs and the number of photoreceptors? I mean, you could actually Something you can do that. That's, I mean, that's perfectly, if you want to do it, that's possible. I mean, again, as, as uh, Sadiq was pointing out, you know, when you change weights and you change formats, you're going to get different answers. But you can, you, if you're worried about the final time, then you can, put, you can you know, change your vector function and push uh, something and do it. No. <laughs> yeah. This is, but that would emphasize the final time as opposed to. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so you might even have uh, DK. Because 
Yes. No, they were, no, they were, um, so there, there were a lot of papers where they came from, and I believe they came from, uh, some of them came from mice, and others were obtained, like I said, using parameter estimation. Parameter, parameter estimation of humans? No. 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 Of mice. mice? Yeah. So they are all related to mice and verified yeah. with we, mice? We actually, we, we did try using uh, parameter values a while ago, um, that came from humans, and um, we were having uh, a lot of numerical issues with that. <laughs> okay. And uh, I had another question. U and V, the control inputs, the max value that they can take is one, right? Um, so, so then we, ch we, did, we chose, so the answer to that is uh, the maximum value is one, but uh, when we were, um, Constructing this, uh, we chose upper bounds that were less than one. Why did you do that? That was um, my question. A, um, a lot of it was to obtain the desired solution. <laughs> um, so then, um, so for instance, if you look at this, these parameter, uh, this maximum upper bounds were at 0.75, I believe. Um, in the previous case where I only had one control, we set them equal to 0.9. Um, we have, we ran numerical experiments where the upper bound varied <laughs> a okay. lot. But in general, you can't really expect to totally turn off a death term. So you can't really expect to do that. So even though it's a good drug, it's not going to totally turn it off. So you, you would normally take it, the upper bound slightly less than one because it's not going to be realistic if you totally turn. It's impossible, you know, when you're doing some treatment, you can't turn it totally off. Right. Yeah. Okay. Thank you.